Essentially, the story broke on the Financial Times first. There's a number of anonymous sources that come from the Israeli IDF that not only was there information about the October 7th attack weeks before the October 7th attack, but the capability, the strategy, the key players, all of it was actively known. Hamas, since 1987, has existed with one purpose, to destroy the state of Israel and replace it with the state of Palestine. To think that they would ever just stop making that their goal takes a pretty incredible amount of hubris and ego. You introduced this concept that was absolutely hilarious to me, and I think that we should actually seriously talk about it. You talked about having a no day. Yeah. <laughs> which I think is hilarious because I think it was last year mm -hmm. Netflix came out. Was it Netflix that came out with a movie called Yes Day? We watched it on Netflix. Yeah, I don't know who made it, but the kids loved the idea, obviously. Everybody yeah. loves the idea of a yes day. Do they? <laughs> 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 yes, because a yes day is like, it's got this awesome, I, this romantic notion to it. It's like, yes to ice cream at breakfast, and yes to going to the theme park, and yes to buying a puppy, and yes to all the things that everybody says no to. Mm -hmm. Yes is like this awesome, exciting, romantic <laughs> idea. But what I found so interesting about your point, mm -hmm. outside of the fact that you're just, you know, Debbie Downer. <laughs> is that no, for some people, is even more exciting than yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I told you what my no day would be like. Are you going to get out of bed? No. Are you going to make me some breakfast? No. Are you going to do anything today? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I feel like that's very much the, yeah. the mom, <laughs> spouse, like... The that's the the internal sacrificer in you who's like I just want a day where I don't have to sacrifice for other people. Yeah, and I think you know, just like you said, it's normally attributed to moms. But I mean, there's I didn't say it was normally. I'm well, not generalizing moms. <laughs> there are plenty of moms out there who yes. love being moms. I'm just saying that it's the you, personality type, right? Your personality yes. type does not lend itself yeah. willingly mm -hmm. to all of the sacrifices of motherhood. Yeah, and I think that we raise our kids trying hard not to say no. And so I live this life of nobody feels like it's a yes day, but I'm trying really hard to make it a yes day, right? I'm trying really hard not to say no to your friends coming in the house and running around screaming for two hours. <laughs> like I'm trying really hard not to say no to uh, my daughter wanting to play spa day with me, <laughs> right? I'm trying, so I'm trying to say yes, and it's so energy intensive that I really just want a day where I can say no to everything. So yeah, what you're really saying is you yeah. want you want to be able to say no to mm -hmm. all the things that you have to try to yeah. do. Because yeah. well, so I, many things take such intense effort. You kind of yes. want to say no to all the extra effort. Yeah, I want to say yes to me. A me yes day. <laughs> what does mom want to do? <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is I think this is really relevant because you mentioned it early on. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is your personality. Yeah. Every personality is different. So yeah. some personalities find creativity and innovation and like ingenuity and change mm -hmm. very exciting. Yes. Some personalities find innovation and change and creativity <laughs> very daunting, very yeah. intimidating, very uh, discouraging, mm -hmm. right? So not people are not all cut from the same cloth. And what's fascinating is the people that we are when we're 10, 12, 15, mm -hmm. we're not really that different mm -hmm. when we're 25, 30, 35 having children. Yeah. And I think what's funny is you and our daughter are very similar where you you like spontaneity, you like new experiences. So the idea of a yes day where every new idea, let's do it, is actually really exciting and energizing mm. for you. Our son is very much like me. And I think what's really funny about He doesn't even want to say yes to anything other than grilled cheese for lunch. Yeah. So I think what's funny about him is he gets excited about the idea of a yes mm. day. 
But when it comes down to practical application of it, he still wants, for example, I made pumpkin pie recently, just trying out a new recipe. He loves pumpkin pie. He still wants his daily ice cream. <laughs> like even if you introduce something new, he's literally like, oh, was the pie dessert? <laughs> because I didn't get my ice cream. And every day he has a, a serving of ice cream and a popsicle, like a fruit juice popsicle afterwards, every single day. So right. he's excited by the idea, but he still wants the routine. And I'm just old enough now <laughs> where I am no longer excited about the idea <laughs> <laughs> because I already know, I know I have enough experience now where I know what that's going to mean. <laughs> it's so funny because you're right. Cena, our son. Yeah is always like open to the idea of change, mm -hmm. but he wants to be able to control the change. Yeah. And then when the moment comes that yes. things have to change, he's kind of like, uh, maybe we can do it tomorrow. Yes. So the next, the yes day for Cena is always tomorrow. Yeah. Because today should be the same as yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow can be a yes day until <laughs> right. tomorrow comes. Then he's like, today, can be the same as yesterday yes. and tomorrow can be the yes day. Yeah, it's the idea of it. I think you we were talking about it recently um, when we were potty training him and we oh yeah we initially motivated him with chocolate milk, but the thing is he doesn't like milk. So he would never actually drink it. It was just the idea of, oh, I use the potty, I get chocolate milk. Yeah. And then we would give it to him and he wouldn't touch it. He'd be like, I don't want this. <laughs> so it's just the idea, right? Of something new something exciting that's so that funny him. yeah and you know so you mentioned how you know Eli, our daughter and i are the same mm -hmm. and you and cena are the same Very really similar. i would argue that our kids are are strange almost perfect combinations yes. of both of us yeah because if all, anything yeah. yeah i would almost say that that our son cena kind of got the perfect mix of all of our weakest elements yeah and Eli got the perfect mix of all of our strongest elements. Oh, explain that. So I feel like our son suffers from the the challenges of wanting exact like uh, routine, uh -huh. like you're talking about, yeah. which is not something you're very proud of in yourself. Mm. And he's also so sensitive, which is exactly what I was like as a kid too, where yeah. every negative comment, every negative criticism, yeah. everything that can be perceived as as Mm -hmm. as uh, negative about you yeah. is what you perceive and attribute the highest value to. Mm -hmm. So he not only feels like he's constantly being criticized, even yeah. when he's being complimented, he still hears the criticism in the compliment, right? Yeah. So he's very sensitive to that. And he's also very sensitive to changes in the routine. Mm. So now when there's a change in the routine, he sees it as, a, as a, it, it being his fault. Yeah. So it's like, hey, we're not going to go to the grocery store today because we ran out of time. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, I must be a bad boy because I must have done something wrong mm. to make it so that we ran out of time. So it's like the worst element in you yeah. and the worst element in me. And he's got to deal with both of them. Interesting. Meanwhile, Eli, another example for our daughter. Yeah. She's taken like these strong elements. So she's got my like brazen, almost reckless risk tolerance. So she'll yeah. just run off a cliff and have confidence that it's going to work out on the other side. She'll ask you first, though. But she won't really ask. <laughs> well, right? get she'll, a heads up. <laughs> she'll go through the process of like advising you that this is what she's going to do. Yeah. And she'll make it sound like you have a say, but you don't really have a say, <laughs> which comes from you. Because you will 100% tell people what you're going to do. And you'll make it feel like they have an opinion when they really don't have an opinion. <laughs> because you know that you're the ultimate final authority. I deny this. <laughs> So like, but you can see how yeah. the two kids, they're, they have these multiple places where they're a mix of elements that we as adults yeah. have come to either try to hold ourselves back in some areas mm. to better fit into society, or we've pushed ourselves past certain behaviors, mm -hmm. but they've adopted them naturally as children. So we see that in them. Yeah. And to your point about, you know, Cena being motivated by the idea of something, mm -hmm. he really did learn how to potty train because he wanted chocolate milk, but he didn't want yeah. chocolate milk because he liked chocolate milk. Right. He wanted chocolate milk because all the TV shows and cartoons mm -hmm. that we were watching were all talking about chocolate milk. Yeah. The kids, the kids in daycare were talking about chocolate milk. So yeah. he was like, I want chocolate milk and all I gotta do is go potty. And no kidding, that kid learned how to go potty. Yeah. He didn't want the M&Ms. No. He wasn't motivated by M&Ms. We tried the whole Cheerios in the toilet bowl no, thing. That didn't he wasn't motivated either. by that. 
We tried reading to him on the potty. We tried we tried everything. So, Music on the potty. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. until chocolate milk that he would actually like mm -hmm. get up and run to the potty and like tell yeah. us from the potty that he needed chocolate milk. Like it was that was the catalyst for that sure. That was it, yeah. right? And at this, I was just talking, we were talking about it because last night, our daughter, Eli, who's mm -hmm. six, is going through this regression in sleep yeah. where she wants company to fall asleep. Yeah. So she wants to cuddle to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. At least with me. I don't know what it's like with you. When she calls me back to cuddle, yeah. it is not a cuddle. <laughs> it's, it's not even close to yeah. a cuddle. When I cuddle next to her, yeah. she pushes me away mm -hmm. and she tells me, don't touch her. Yeah. And sit on the other side of the bed. Yeah. And she usually tells me to put like blankets or stuffed animals between us. Yeah. So I don't have any idea how this is. Cut. But she still says, yeah, I want daddy to cuddle with me before I fall asleep. Yeah. But she really only wants me in the room present on the other side of the bed mm -hmm. for like two or three minutes. That's all she really wants. Yeah. And it's the same for me. She tells me, please go lay over there. And then she, in fact, she says, why don't you read your book? And then I can look over as she likes to count the lines in my my book or whatever. But yeah, it's definitely not. She just wants the company there. She wants the comfort. And I would say, you know, it's funny because, you know, you use the words strength and weakness, um, you know, which I would argue isn't completely accurate because, you know, the sen like, for example, the sensitivity that our son has, I think, lends itself to this natural empathy that he shows towards people. Our son knows immediately when I am upset and and cha and addresses it. Where her daughter completely <laughs> just she is the one that makes me upset, <laughs> and she has zero idea. You know, and part of that can be age, but I do think that part of that is their personality traits that they have inherited yeah. from us. Um, and I I think what's great is that us being able to see ourselves reflected in them in different ways we are better able to address um, you know, things that we wish we had known when, when we were kids. We wished that we had been treated a different way when we were kids. And now we're able to try to implement those things. It's you know, our great parenting experiment and you know, see if we can do a, a better job or you know, prepare them better for life. It's true. I mean, the only thing harder than marriage that I have seen oh my gosh. is parenthood. Yes. Yeah. And then the fact that you have like parenthood and marriage. At the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Who thought that was a good idea? Oh my gosh. It's like, it's just a, it's a constant daily kick in the balls is what that is. Like, it's just horrible. <laughs> well, and you know, what's interesting I, is I have read, and my mind always goes back to, because you travel now, um, and my mind always goes back to, you know, the whole concept of it takes a village to raise a child. There's a reason that statement exists. And I've been reading these articles about, you know, the studies of hunter-gatherer societies and the way that children are raised in those societies. And it's never just... Mm the mom raising the kids there's this whole like support network of the mom the grandma the aunts the neighbor the cousins everybody helps raise the children and which offloads the pressure on being a spouse offloads the pressure on being a parent um and it's just our modern day western society has moved away from that and i think that's part of what yeah. I would say there's multiple things going on there. Right. Don't, I, I but I do wanna, think that's part of it. I wouldn't want to over-dramatize the value of a hunter-gather society <laughs> since we don't have to hunt or gather our food right now. That's fair. Like, there's certain benefits that come with the grocery store. <laughs> and I know from where I sit, having to raise your own children in order to use a grocery store doesn't sound like that bad of a trade-off. Well, I do. What I do wonder is the... When you're in a something like a hunter-gatherer society or when you're, you live in a culture where the grandparents are really heavily involved, mm -hmm. how much change happens, how much parenting evolution happens in raising the children vice what we have where we are fairly radically separated different from our parents. and we are able to radically yeah. you know, change our parenting style because there is no other influence. So is there an actual benefit? There might be more stress, but is there an actual benefit in the human evolution having parents be able to really forge their own path? Yeah, absolutely. There's a benefit there. I mean, yeah. I don't think there's any doubt there. What's interesting to me is that I, I feel like, to your point, the great Western society that we live in is in part driven by the fact that every new generation of parents mm -hmm. wants to be able to raise their kids on their own. Yeah. 
we don't want to raise our kids the way we were raised. Right. Very rarely have I met a an adult mm -hmm. who has good things to say about how they were raised. Yeah, there's always some things people want to change. Well, I mean, not only is there always some things, but mm -hmm. the vast majority of people that I've met, the vast majority of educated, uh, you know, intelligent, hardworking, successful people that we've mm -hmm. met distinctly want to raise their kids differently than the way they were raised. Interesting. Like ho almost holistically, like almost yeah. completely want to change the way. They'll still say, oh, I loved how my mom was always there for me when I got hurt. Or I loved how my yeah. dad always came to my, you know, dance recital or my piano event. So I want to do that for my kids. Yeah. But otherwise, I want to give them more attention. I want to give them more resources. I want to, you know, yeah. give them more opportunities. I want to not drink as much as my parents drank. I want to not smoke as much as my parents smoked. I want to be gone less than my parents were gone. Most of the people that I've that we've met in our world, which again, you have to be cognizant of the fact that we in our world, we are not dealing with people who are of a different socioeconomic status than mm, us. That's fair. Right? We don't spend a lot of time with people who make thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Yeah. We spend a great deal of time with people who make more than one hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars a year. So we have a a, a social bias as that's well. Fair. Yeah. But in that bias that we've seen, that group of people who are fiscally uh, and career success stories, mm -hmm. almost almost across the board, they do not want to raise their kids the same way mm -hmm. they were raised. Oftentimes, it's because they are also significantly more successful than their parents were. Yeah. And that's certainly the case for us too, right? Like there's certain things that you love about your, how you were raised. Mm -hmm. There are a few things, a very few things I enjoyed about the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. But we are also hands and feet more successful than our parents were, right. which was exactly what our parents wanted for us in the first place. Right. So I don't begrudge my family at all for what they, how they raised us. They raised us the way that they had to raise us. Right. As a family of five living through the 1980s and 90s mm -hmm. on two parents who I think, I think I made more money than my dad made. Mm-hmm. When I graduated college, yeah. my first job in the military was earning more money than what he was making at his job that he was retiring from within five years of me graduating college. I yeah. mean, that's mind boggling. Yeah. So we started off on completely different pla you know, pathways anyways. Yeah. But it is really interesting to me because I'm willing to bet that the majority of you listening right now are probably also sitting there nodding your head saying, yeah, I want to raise my kids completely different than yeah. the way I was raised. Which is why we put so much care and effort into picking the daycares that they go to, the schools districts that we belong to, mm -hmm. the private schools that we enroll them in. We are actively involved in knowing who their teachers are and what their teachers are teaching them. We care about their friends. We care about the parents mm -hmm. of their friends, right? Like if anything, there's an element of us going, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it's too far, but I've certainly heard people criticize that parents nowadays go too far into controlling yeah. the entire experience of their child. Yeah. The reason I don't agree with that is because I absolutely want to be heavily engaged in cultivating the entire experience hmm. for our children. Because when they're adults, they will then be at a place cognitively mm -hmm. where they can make their own choices rationally, emotionally, you know, with the full suite of cognitive skills. Yeah. At 10 years old, they don't have that. Yeah. At 10 years old, they need someone to help them process through things. And that's not going to happen with some of the friends that they've made. And that's not going to happen in some of the school districts that exist here in Florida. So we've made our own choices. Hey, you're just giving me such little hope. <laughs> for, for what? There's tons of hope. You, were, you just said everybody wants to <laughs> raise their children different than the way they were raised. I did not say everybody. <laughs> okay. I said the, the majority of the people who are listening to our conversations. Mm -hmm are going to agree with that. Some One will day not, our children fine. are going to have a podcast and they're going to have the same conversation. <laughs> our kids are going to watch this podcast <laughs> and get mad at me someday. Oh my gosh. <laughs> our son has already talked about watching the podcast. Yeah. He's already been like, oh, because I travel. Yep. <laughs> I, I'm gone so much for this TV show shoot. And he's like, oh, dad, don't worry about it. I'll just watch the podcast someday. I'll watch you on YouTube because YouTube's here forever. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. It's yeah. so wild. Yeah. It's so wild. But anyway, so thank you very much mm -hmm. for voicing your desire for a no day. Yeah. And one day. One day I would love to be the I would love to be the husband <laughs> that can give you 
a day mm -hmm. where all you have to do is say no to other people. I think that my no day should be your yes day. No, two That's totally different things. No? Just take a second. Mm -hmm. Think about the kind of things I would ask you to do on a yes day. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, it's my no day. It's mine. That's exactly my point. My no day. Your yes day. You one on two with the kids saying yes to everything. You are going to come out looking so good with the makeup and, and the same nails. day you get to say no to everything. Yes. I I'm going to just hide in my room. Wow. <laughs> just think about it. That's my okay. offer. Okay. Will do. So speaking of... <laughs> Kicks to the balls. <laughs> we are getting our first bits of information mm -hmm. that the Hamas attack against Israel on October 7th mm -hmm. may be an intelligence failure. That yeah. there may have actually been information, there may have been intelligence reporting mm -hmm. to point to that event mm -hmm. that was either uh, overlooked, misdirected, mm -hmm. or incorrectly analyzed. Yeah, it's not a surprise. So you say it's not a surprise. I think it's kind of a surprise. Why do you think it is not a surprise? Considering the fact that Shin Bet and Mossad are two of the most sophisticated, best well, best trained and most well-funded intelligence services in the world, how is it not a surprise to you that they would have made a mistake? So I think that we can look to the past and see other huge intelligence failures. So it's not mm. unheard of to have something like this happen you're not necessarily talking about israel you mean across the globe. oh yeah i mean just look at I mean, well -funded, 9 11 well-funded intelligence organizations yeah. i mean how how we afghanistan was a massive intelligence yeah. failure we didn't expect that to turn out the way it turned out right the invasion of ukraine the counterattacks in ukraine yeah. we didn't Iraq. expect those things I mean, to there's, yeah. yeah there have been lots of very big public intelligence failures right. um and so it's not a surprise to me that this happened um it's also, you know, some right now, some of the, you know, anonymous sources are saying that there was information that was passed up. Um, and that is not surprising to me because there's in my mind when I heard about the attack, I was like, there's zero probability in my mind that nobody knew mm. anything about it. Nothing is actually secret, right? I mean, it's so, especially something so large, mm. you know, it's, it's really difficult to hide. I mean, that's why you know, when Russia started amassing troops on the on the border of Ukraine, like they weren't you can't hide that. Right. They were just using propaganda and their, you know, their usual if you say it enough times, if you deny it enough, people what believe are pe it. people believe it or people aren't going to feel comfortable pointing out that you're lying, right? right? Um so it's really difficult when it comes to um something as large as that to hide it. Even even the attackers of 9/11, which were was a small, a relatively small team of people to do an operation that had a giant impact, even that there was intel on those movements, mm -hmm. right? So the fact that it existed is isn't a surprise at all. So where's the two questions for mm -hmm. you? So first, if the fact that secrets exist mm -hmm. is not the hard part, right? What is the hard part? That's my first question. So the hard part, I think, come, you know, I always try to remind people, especially people, especially conspiracy theorists, a conspiracy theory it makes the assumption that you have these individuals who have this master plan and have the foresight and the mm. follow through to make something big happen. And the funding. And the funding, right? <laughs> you know, but the truth of the matter is, for the most part, you know, mistakes, and a mistake is much more likely than a conspiracy, yeah, yeah. right? For the, you know, for the most part, these are human beings sitting in a government role. They either get cocky and don't believe it, or they get cocky and they don't want to communicate with the other services. Um, you information know, just gets buried. Information gets buried, right? There's, I mean, the people collecting, you know, the people collecting are at the lower levels. Mm -hmm. The people they're reporting to who have the power to take action are at higher levels. So it has to go all the way up the chain. And then the person at the higher level has to deem that information credible enough to take action. Right. And if they don't, for whatever reason, 
um, you know, they just, it's going to, that information gets lost and then things happen. So for people who haven't heard yet about this kind of breakthrough information, mm -hmm. essentially the story broke on the Financial Times first. Mm -hmm. There's a number of anonymous sources that come mm -hmm. from the Israeli IDF yeah. specifically mm -hmm. um, that have spoken or leaked anonymously to the Financial Times mm -hmm. that not only was there information about the October 7th attack mm -hmm. weeks before the October 7th attack, right. but the the capability, the strategy, the, the key players, all of it was actively known. Right. There were, yeah. I have not seen anything that says that they knew October 7th would be the day. Right. But the fact that they had a buildup of troops, a buildup mm -hmm. of commanders, a buildup of cap of uh, of capabilities, mm -hmm. actual dress rehearsals of the attack, all yeah. leading up to October seventh, yeah. sp speaks to that kind of uh, the the confidence they had in that intel. Right. So can you can you briefly run through what is the story? What are the information bits that are coming through Financial Times as a single source so far? Correct. That are telling us about what happened. Uh, in the lead up to October 7th. Right. So right now it's just anonymous sources, you know, providing information. Um, what kind of information? And talking about, you know, they were uh, the intelligence officers who were on the border were able to, um, who monitored the border, were seeing movements, just like you said, they were seeing known, you know, a known Hamas leader overseeing rehearsals of an attack, um, overseeing rehearsals of uh, practiced kidnappings, for example. Um, they had intelligence that they, uh, of, you know, what actually happened where they, you know, they would distract with rockets and while they, you know, had troops on the ground. So there were a number of details mm -hmm. that were observed by the lower level, the, the border, you know, the border intelligence officers that were put into a report and then sent up the chain. And with that much detail, at, at least, you know, like you said, that the date, it's really, it's actually really difficult to know the date an attack is going to happen. Right. Usually, you know, even when you look at American terrorist cases, usually they know something is imminent is the word, but nobody, you know, to, to know an actual date, I mean, those are usually people on the ground and it's really hit or miss whether whether or not you're going to be able to, to actually stop an attack. So I'm not saying that the information would have stopped an attack. Right. Right. But if somebody had taken it, taken the information as credible as, and you, they they could Made have at least actionable. prepared, yeah. right? Actionable. They could have prepared better or at least looked more into it to verify. It's really difficult because it's intelligence agencies are government agencies. Yeah. There is a clear hierarchy. There's a process. There's a process. There's a bureaucracy. Exactly. And you have to take into consideration the egos of the people involved. Just yeah. like I said, they're all human beings. The people who are at the top have confidence. If you are the leader of the CIA, you're the leader of the IDF, you're the leader of the MSS, you have confidence that your country is awesome. Yeah. Right? None, of those, none of those people are sitting in those seats thinking, oh, wow, we're really vulnerable to a terrorist attack right now. Yeah. Nobody's sitting up there thinking that. So when they have a report that comes up and says, hey, guys, we're this is this it looks like this is going to happen. Maybe we should do something about it. They're like, you know, who are these people? So I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit on this one, right? Yeah. Because because first, I don't think the average person understands what an intelligence report mm. looks like. Not mm -hmm. necessarily like how it's formatted, but but what are the steps that go into making an intelligence report? Mm -hmm. Because it's not like it's not like a school book report. Right. Where you just write your opinions down and then the teacher gets it. It's not that simple. Right. And I do think that the process of creating an intelligence report the vulnerability in that process is part of what happened here. Mm. But then second, I also want you to be able to explain what happened. Like if what what are you reading? What have you researched that says intelligence was gathered, but then it wasn't disseminated? So what was the process that led to it not being disseminated? Or what was the process that led to it not being deemed credible? Right. So it was disseminated. It the so the general process with with intelligence collection is there's a number of sources 
um, you know, and of course I, I'm not part of the IDF, but in general, there are a number of sources, they gather the information, the analyst takes all of that information. They don't just give it up raw. They take the information. So for example, you know, they might have the, they said they had the, uh, the Hamas leader. So they identified him by, they had video of the practice session going on and they identified that leader by running his face through a database, right? So there's all this background work because they, when they push it up, when they push that Intel report up, they have to be certain, right? Or at least they have to know, they have to be able to tell the higher ups the level of probability of what they think they are seeing, mm -hmm. right? That's what analysis is, is assessing, you know, taking all the information and assessing the level of probability of this is this is happening. And, and because we see these things happening, we we assess that this is a likely scenario that's going to happen or a likely probability, you know, a likely outcome that's probable. And then they put it in a nice, easy to read package and it goes, especially when it's really high up and it goes up and it's usually briefed by a person when you're that, at that high of a level, a person briefs the actual, you know, here's bottom line up top, here are the most important points, you know, here here's the most important details. And then if they want more, they can read more, they can ask more questions. So more intelligence reports will be written. And more intelligence reports will be written. So what happened Correct. here? They could have done more intelligence reports had yeah. somebody taken the, re the initial report seriously. So what happened here? Because you haven't told us what happened. I'm sorry. You keep talking about the outcome without so, telling us what happened. So it's like what's, the worst part of a movie. What's being, sorry. Uh, so what the Financial Times has reported so far is that the uh, lead commander that it, that this intelligence report was briefed to decided that Hamas, that there was no way that this could be real, that this was a completely imaginary scenario, that there's no way Hamas actually has the capability or the inclination, that's what's so fascinating to mm. me, that the commander actually, actually decided, actually felt that Hamas didn't have the inclination to attack because everybody knew what the outcome of the attack would be. So the, we've ta I've talked about this before, understanding the mind of your opponent, mm -hmm. right? When we, it's so important in intelligence, when we you know, go up against China or Russia or anybody who's, I mean, even if they're not a, a complete adversary, we go, you know, we're working with the French, we're working with the Canadians. You have to understand what they want. their mindset and their motivations yeah. because how in the world could you think that Hamas wouldn't be desperate enough to, to cause this, to trigger this chain reaction, yeah. right? I mean, how much hubris and ego would that man have had? You know, and, and I'm not Israeli, so... Right. So I have to put myself into, you know, just the same way. Right. Put yourself into the you know, Palestinian mindset. Put yourself into the Israeli mindset. Right. And you can see when you do that how those perspectives can exist. But from an outside perspective, mm. having watched the scenario unfold over the years, I just think to myself, I mean, what a shame. Right. What a shame that maybe it couldn't have been prevented but maybe it could have been mitigated, you know? Maybe the attack would have happened anyways, but less people would have died or it would have ended sooner. I mean, not even that it's necessarily over now, but. So I also wanna make sure that we're, we're driving home the fact that what we're talking about right now is questionably credible. Yeah. The idea that this is an intelligence yes. failure is not on its own even credible yet. Right, and because it's so soon after the fact anyways. It's well, not like, only that, but yeah. we're talking about one news source. Yes. Only the Financial Times has yes. broken this story. Yeah. All of their witnesses mm -hmm. are anonymous. Right, they're, yes. They're talking to anonymous mm -hmm. uh, border patrol. They're, they're claiming that they are talking to mm -hmm. anonymous people who are knowledgeable of mm -hmm. border patrol activity and closed circuit television monitoring uh, yeah. uh, efforts. Mm -hmm. So we have no idea even what type of source they're talking to. We right. don't know if they're talking to somebody inside the IDF. We don't know right. if they're talking to somebody who's a brother of somebody inside the IDF. Mm -hmm. There's 
there's no source chain of acquisition here right. that we can use to even call the reports credible. And the fact that they're only coming from one place, right. one news source mm -hmm. is, so it all it calls everything into question. True. But my point is, if there is validity to it, mm -hmm. then it's, it's going to make for a very difficult conversation moving forward. Because now right. we start asking ourselves the questions, did the intelligence services know this was coming? If so, which intelligence service knew it? Mm -hmm. Mossad or Shin Bet? Right. Because Shin Bet, if Shin Bet knew that there was actually, Shin Bet being the internal uh, law enforcement, national security uh, arm mm -hmm. of national security for mm -hmm. Israel, if Shin Bet knew and simply rejected it, mm -hmm. that's a bad day. Yeah. If Mossad knew, they don't really have charge for protecting the homeland inside the homeland. Mm -hmm. Their job is just to communicate it to Shin Bet. Yeah. But then there's also a third group, the military intelligence wing, that mm -hmm. falls under the IDF. If they knew it, what does that mean? Yeah. And who's the one making the decisions? And how is the hierarchy working? And right. And you're right. The, the hubris is significant. But yeah. I mean, all the Hamas since 1987 has existed with one purpose: right. to destroy the state of Israel mm -hmm. and replace it with the state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. That's been their goal. Right. To think that they would ever just stop making that their goal yeah. takes an, a pretty incredible amount of, of hubris and ego. Yeah. But at the same time, Hamas has been under a very specific disinformation operation mm -hmm. for the past, I think they said five years, mm -hmm. where they have been trying to placate yeah. the, the right-wing fundamentalists mm -hmm. in Israel mm -hmm. to make them believe that... They are totally yeah. satisfied to be ruling in Gaza mm -hmm. as long as they're getting aid and food and fuel mm -hmm. and that the West Bank is the real problem. Yeah. And now for the last year and a half, all resources have been focused on the West Bank mm -hmm. and nobody's been paying attention to Gaza. Yeah. And which I think I think is very smart of them and I think is fascinating because it's, it's very tactical. It's, very tactical of the Hamas strategist strategists. Right. And it's been used before in yeah. other places in the world. It's yep. not like this is a, a completely unheard of strategy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, yeah, it's interesting to me. And I think that just like you said, when you can't, when you can't fully verify a source, it's important to just take that informa information as one data point in your ongoing assessment, right? You can't say, oh my gosh, I read this article. This is true. This is the way it is. It's one data point yeah. and you keep it as a part of the conversation, but you have to re remember that it's one data point in this larger ongoing assessment that you will continue to read the news and read the updates because it's going to take a long time yeah. for the truth of it to come out. And the important thing I think to do now is to start really looking at what happened to try to understand so those mistakes aren't made again. And on the other side of that coin, they really need to figure out what to do because the Israel-Palestine situation is absolutely unsustainable. And the, you can't, something has to be radically changed moving forward. They need to figure it out because, yeah, it's like I said, this wasn't a surprise to me. This could have been avoided years ago if they had just, you know. Unfortunately, the whole world agrees with you yeah. when you say the words, they need to figure this out. The Israelis and the Palestinians. Everybody sees yeah. it as their problem. And, and Nobody anybody sees who it. wants to help them. No, I'm, I'm not. You know. I'm just saying the truth of it is, even as we sit here, yeah. we have an opinion. Everybody has an opinion. Yeah. But when it comes down to where the rubber meets the road for the vast majority of people, they push that problem off and they say, it's your problem. You figure it out. Mm -hmm. And when you push that problem to Israel and Palestine, what you're actually doing is you're pushing that problem to the third richest country mm -hmm. in Asia, basically, mm -hmm. and the poorest subjected group of refugees yeah. anywhere in the area. Yeah. And because and, it's... And when you tell them they have to figure it out together... Yeah. And it's the, kind of a, it's, it's a foregone conclusion. Yeah. And issues involving land and resources are always the most complex. Yep. And they're always going to go to the yeah. person with the most money and the, and the most guns. Yeah. And it's just, that's just the way it is for now until, yeah. unfortunately, until yeah. some sort of disaster forces it to be different. I mean, I'm hoping that this is the disaster and then 
it improves from here. Yeah. You and I, you and I often have conversations about your hopes. <laughs> I'm a you keep hoping for that no day too. <laughs> yeah. Keep hoping for that no day, babe. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, I'll keep hoping for world peace. <laughs> world peace and no days. No days for moms and world peace for all. I wish I lived in your world. That would be such a, I mean, do you just One day, eat- maybe you will. I mean, for real, do you eat candy corn for breakfast every day? Oh, <laughs> gross. <laughs> candy corn. <laughs> Sorry to all the people who like candy corn, but- All ugh. three of you, yeah. <laughs> so the the last thing I want to do is I, I had a podcast recently, a, pos- a podcast interview. Mm-hmm. where somebody invited me to come talk. And they asked such an awesome question at the end of the podcast. And I had to bring it over here and I had to share it with you because very rarely do I feel fully stumped by a question, mm-hmm. like where I really didn't, I wasn't able to process an answer very quickly. And I had to like ask for a few seconds. Normally I just pop off in the mouth. <laughs> but uh, but this person asked a question I thought it was so great. So I want to get your reaction. So here's my question to you. By way of uh, Anthony Mo, former Titans uh, football player, okay, asked me the question: How do you pick a good spouse? And that is my question to you. By way of Anthony, <laughs> how do you pick a good spouse? Did I pick a good spouse? That was my. That was exactly <laughs> was that what went through my head. I was like, I don't, I'm pretty sure I did a good job, but my wife really sucked. Sucked at that one. She she took a bullet to the face. <laughs> but yes. it's such how do you do it so what are your thoughts i mean i want to how do you pick a good spouse for everybody out there p- trying to pick a spouse or pick a new spouse yeah how do you do it you know it's so funny because i was just talking to a friend about relationships the other day and i really it's i give the most horrible advice <laughs> that's a great way to answer yes start this answer right there because part of you know part of how I choose is because I want to feel that fire, right? Because she was dating a guy who she was like, he checks every single box, but we're doing long distance. And when I think about having to make time to talk to him every day on the phone, Mm. she's like, I'm kind of not inspired to do it. And I was like, well, like he doesn't sound like the guy. Even, Even if he's the most perfect guy, I feel so... I I feel like this is a horrible answer, but for me, in part, I have to feel the fire. I have to feel the chemistry. Like, I want to spend all of my moments with you. Mm -hmm. Even when I want to be alone, I'm at least thinking about you and how I want to be with you once I'm done recharging, right? (laughs) (laughs) Like, like like for me, that's really important. Mm -hmm. And then- Chemistry. The chemistry of it, because- what about all the girls that have tons of chemistry and then the dude's a dirtbag? Because you've had plenty of... You're, I don't you're, think that's you're, real chemistry. But it still feels like chemistry. So how do you know the difference? Yeah. So I think, you know, I, I think I've talked to you about this, how I feel like we should have some kind of like pre-marriage boot camp where you like force people into these situations where you see if they suck or not. <laughs> <laughs> You mean partners? You mean partners? Yes, partners. Par- <laughs> like you like, speak so generally sometimes. Sorry, like, I'm like, do you mean we're going to put people through boot camp so we can see if they suck? No, so they so can they see can if see their if- partner sucks. <laughs> because you know, you spend the week with somebody, and there's so much chemistry, and they're so hot, and we're so perfect together. But then you throw in a mm. scenario where, like, who's going to stay up with the baby all night while the other one has the, you know, like all these things that happen. Like, you know, your somebody close to you dies. How does your partner support you? right? You lose your job. Your whole life changes. You're, you have kids. You lose a child. I mean, mm. all these things that happen in life that, you know, how is your partner going to change with you? Because that's something I absolutely didn't fully conceptualize when we got married is how much people, people talk about change, but I couldn't really conceptualize it until it started to happen. So how will that partner change with you and grow with mm. you and support you in the in times that you need and then do you want to do those same things for them Mm. right like when they need you are you going to drop everything to go be with them you know if they lose their job are you going to support them when they're moping around the house for three months Mm. you know you know it's funny because uh, i'm pretty sure that there are there i'm i'm certain i just don't know how prevalent it is there are schools 
that are sponsored by churches yeah that put pastors through this kind of training yes I like think a pastor brilliant. that's being prepared to go out and start a new church mm -hmm. especially if they're a young newly married pastor they actually mm -hmm. will go through some kind of boot camp where yeah just like you said it's like a simulation of five days or seven days or 14 days mm -hmm. where the wife and the family mm -hmm. get to experience what it's like to have a, a father or a husband or a spouse or yeah. vice versa if the female is the pastor yeah that's at truly at the beck and call of the church. Yeah. So he gets called away to go pray over a sick person. Yeah. And then the a phone call comes in and the wife is needed to go oversee some sort of other disaster mm -hmm. that's happening because she's the wife of the pastor, right? Yeah. And then what do you do with the kids? And oh, the kids have to come with us. And then you're all, the whole family's up until 3 a.m. supporting mm -hmm. the church. And then you come back together and you think you're going to sleep. And then mm -hmm. some like something else happens. There's a financial disaster that happens. Yeah. And one of your big donors bails on you and you have to come up with a half million dollars for next quarter. Yeah. Like So they there's there are schools that put people through that. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because I remember talking to one of the pastors that that we went to mm -hmm. and he was explaining that process and, and he was saying that it was it had a huge washout rate yeah that I bet. something like something like three out of every five pastors that have been tapped on the shoulder to seed a new church don't make it wow because they just can't like they realize the household the marriage itself isn't strong enough to support mm -hmm. a house and a church yeah yeah that's oh, really that's interesting. really interesting. So I still don't know the answer to your question. The answer, to, your answer to the question. I, I, I hear you say chemistry. So I think chemistry but then, is important. But then it's the how do you know it's real chemistry part that I'm still foggy on. I think part of that, maybe it comes down to, because I'm trying to think of, of what has helped us through. And I think part of it. Is, it's not what's helped us through. It's how did we pick each other? That's what I found so interesting about I, the question. So I think it's unless the same maybe thing we for me. didn't, unless maybe we didn't know we were going to be good spouses when we first met. Well, I mean, when we when we got engaged, we promised each other we would never divorce. I mean, this was a a one time deal for us, yeah. right? And you've Forever. regretted that choice at least three times in the <laughs> last thirteen years. <laughs> maybe a little bit, <laughs> but then I got over that hump. But I do think. That from the beginning, I have loved the way that you have communicated. Mm -hmm. You don't communicate like anybody in my family does. You are always open and honest and you want to have the conversation. And I find that, I find that to be really powerful and important because as you go through all the difficult, if all the difficulties in life, as you go through all the changes in life, if you can't openly and honestly communicate about it. I mean, I literally just had a conversation with you where you were like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I, I, my heart, <laughs> I want to be a princess. I want you to work and I want to be home and take care of the house. And I just kind of want you to take care of me in my heart, which is so embarrassing to me to ever admit to anybody. <laughs> right. But I, you know, we're at a point where I know I can say these things to you because I've said lots of things to you, you know, um, over the years that we've been together. And I know that you will always weather whatever I have to say. You know, you will always talk to me about it and, you know, explore the whys yeah. with me and think of options for us. So I know that no matter what happens, and I knew that in the beginning, I knew when we were dating on top of the chemistry, I knew in the beginning that you would always talk to me about things. Mm -hmm. There would never be secrets. That was a big one for me. I remember that. No secrets. Yeah. No lies. Which is hilarious considering <laughs> where we met. I know. That may, that's part of why it was so important. Mm -hmm. You know, because we knew people who whose wives never knew, who her spouses we never knew. We still know people, know people, people like whose spouses never know what's going on. We know people who that was their agreement as spouses. Yes. Yes. Where, where like one spouse is like, you'll do all of this. I don't even want to know about it. Mm -hmm. I'll do all of that. Don't even ask me about it. Yeah. And you're like. Mm. And you know what? That brings up a really interesting point too, because for me, the communication is huge, but maybe what's the bet, maybe the better indicator is the covenant that you make with a partner. Because I feel like, I try not to judge other people's relationships because I feel like as long as the covenant itself, the the promise you've made to each other. Whatever that promise is. Whatever that promise is, the arrangement that you have with each other, you have both openly and honestly agreed to. Mm. That is your relationship. That's how you feel most comfortable and how you want to be with your partner. Hmm. So maybe that's... 
how the do you most, pick a good spouse? Maybe that's how you pick a good spouse is the spouse that when you make your promises to each other, taking into consideration, you know, forever, is that the, are these the promises that you're willing to do forever? I'm that's not interesting. Sure. Not surprisingly, I had a completely different answer than yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> tell me your answer. And also not surprisingly, I hear your answer and I'm like, what kind of like... I just know you're, you're not a face guy, so you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but your answer is all wiggly. I'm like, you make promises, but promises change like what just, if i promised you that i'd give you vanilla ice cream but then you're lactose intolerant 10 years into our marriage am i the one breaking my promise like i don't this is this is all too nebulous for me verbal processing so my answer what i landed on yeah after my you know extended pause of let me think about this yeah um is i i think that the way you pick a good spouse is by making sure that you can have hard conversations before you ever Mm -hmm. commit to marriage yeah because kind of like what you were talking about yes. with being prepared for the worst yes if you can be prepared for the worst those are hard conversations you need to have i will never forget oh yeah i will never ever in my life forget the conversation that you and i had in your second trimester with our mm -hmm. first child mm -hmm. where we literally wrote down on a piece of paper the next five actions i would take Mm -hmm. if you died mm -hmm. or not if you died if the doctor said i had to pick between saving you or saving the baby mm -hmm. i will never forget that day yeah. like it was it was just to to have that conversation with you to literally pull out a sheet of paper mm -hmm. and then to write down the first five things i would do mm -hmm. it was strangely like terrifying yeah. and and empowering at the same time cuz it cuz at least in my mind's eye i was like well at least now i don't have to think yeah when you don't have to wonder when that moment yeah. comes i don't have to wonder what you would want i don't have to yeah. wonder what i would do i don't have to think about it i just can just i can just sit there awestruck yeah and pull the piece of paper out of my breast pocket and give it to the doctor <laughs> yeah. right but that's a hard conversation yeah the thing is though that's that's what hard conversations look like mm -hmm. when you're pregnant getting ready to have children yeah but hard conversations when you're newlywed look mm -hmm. totally different hard conversations when you're engaged look totally different they're yeah. still just as hard yeah they just look very different right who's going to sit next to who and who's not going to get invited to the anniversary party and yes. you know who's yeah who's nephews and nieces aren't welcome at the house for whatever else like yeah those are just as difficult to have mm -hmm. even though they may sound like they have less stake right they're just as difficult to have yeah. at different phases of your relationship and then right? how do you navigate those conversations Correct. so if you navigate them well together then that's a good sign right even now mm -hmm. we're still having hard conversations yes. but now we have hard conversations like two co-owners of a successful business with two young kids that are homeschooled yeah you know, living in Florida, preparing for a move. Yeah. That's how our hard conversations are now. Yeah. But we still get to have them. Mm -hmm. And the thing that is always shocking to me is when, like, I again, I, I can't help but look at my own family. Mm. My family is rife, like riddled with divorce. Mm. And time and time again, even multiple marriages and multiple divorces through my family, mm -hmm. I have seen that my family does not like to have hard conversations yeah. they would rather just push it off ignore it pretend it isn't there let mm -hmm. it go away it doesn't go away mm -hmm. well let's just cut this thing off and yeah. be done with it and my family's the opposite we don't have divorce but still nobody has that hard conversation they just push it off and push it but off everybody's and just angry maybe drink it away and True. you know yeah everybody in your well not everybody there are people in your family that constantly talk about mm. divorce uh, I'm mm. going to leave him. I'm going to leave her. Mm. This is going to end. This can't last forever. Mm. And yet it just keeps. Yeah. And the conversation never happens. It keeps lasting. Yeah. yeah. To fix whatever's going on. Yeah. So that's my, my thought is yeah. if you want to pick the right spouse, yeah. you got to pre-qualify them, test them in advance with having hard conversations. Yeah. And then on top of that, if you still feel the fire mm -hmm. and the chemistry is good, mm -hmm. then you have, you have a good spouse. Yeah. Boom. I like your thoughts there, girl. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us, folks. We would love to hear your thoughts. Let us know what you think about Jeehee's no day idea. <laughs> and if you would like to have a no day yourself, or if you're more of a yes day person like me and you want all the opportunities and all the fun that comes from having a yes day where nobody says no to you, 
And then of course, if you haven't found the articles yet by the Financial Times, go ahead and take a look, uh, look at the Financial Times recent history, recent news, talking about whether or not there may have been information in advance of the October 7th attack that Hamas launched against Israel and Gaza. And see for yourself what some of the reporting is. And it's going to be really interesting to watch how that story spreads over multiple news platforms and mm -hmm. whether or not it's verified in the next few weeks. And then lastly, if you are in the business of being married, in the business of getting married, or in the business of wanting to one day be married, I hope that our insights gave you something to look forward to. And if you yourself have a good answer, I really genuinely want to know, how do you pick a good spouse? I absolutely want to know your answer because that was one of the hardest questions I've ever had to answer. Thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to see you next time. Visit us at everydayspy.com and share us with a friend. Take care. Freedom! So fresh, so new.